teachings of peace, hope, and love in Romans chapter 5. You know, according to a lot of biblical scholars, the first words of Romans chapter 5, uh, it actually begins a new section in Paul's letter. You know, Paul didn't write this in chapter and verse. But in this particular uh, point, in this verse, in chapter 5, uh, he starts and he says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith. I heard someone teach one time, and they said, Anytime you see the word therefore, look back and see what it's there for. And so Paul has been talking to us. The word therefore draws our attention to what he had previously argued, the justification by faith in God alone, and works has no part of it. And this is what he's been talking about in the first four chapters in the book of Romans. Furthermore, he shifts his tone from one of camaraderie signaled by his change in pronoun use. Now, you may not have caught that when you read it, but he goes from the singular to the first person plural pronoun. And finally, there are words of faith and belief that dominate the first four chapters. Faith and belief. But in now the words in uh, this chapter all the way through chapter 8 become life and live. And we see this all the way through chapter 8. So he describes this life as consisting of several blessings that are actually corresponding to the Old Testament blessings that we see in, uh, in the covenant that is previously uh, before the new covenant. So these new blessings are based on the stipulation of faith in Christ as part, a part separate from the law of Moses. And with that in mind, what I want to address this morning is three things. First of all, peace through justification. And secondly, hope through suffering. And thirdly, salvation through love. So I want to begin in verse 1 and 2 with uh, the blessings of peace. And you follow with me there if you will. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into His grace in which we now stand. You know, these verses give us the first blessings of the new covenant belonging to the Christian. It's really peace with God based on justification by faith. So we have peace with God, but the only reason we have it is because of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. When He justifies us before God because of our faith. This piece is based on the stipulation of faith in Christ alone, I might add. There's no other, no other works. There's no other way. It's just Jesus. I like that. Just Jesus. Oh, that's cool. You have to put that on a t-shirt. You put some kind of cross on it. It says, just Jesus. Amen. All right. In fact, I think on our website, there's a, there's a term on there about worship. And it says, no judging, just Jesus. And I think that's or should be our motto. So the peace is based on this stipulation of Christ alone. And here we find that because we've been justified with this peace with God, uh, we also get a reference in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, and it declares that we have the peace of God, which transcends what? What does it transcend? You know, all understanding. The peace of God is so great that we cannot fathom its depth. And this seems to be what Paul is talking about. And it's, it's interesting that the Dead Sea Scrolls speak of an entry into a new covenant of grace. And it seems to be this is what Paul had in mind when he is using this unusual term, which is, have gained access. You don't gain access in the old, to God in the Old Testament. There's no way to do that. But in the New Testament, we have gained access to the grace of God. You know, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, it says, For through Him, that's Jesus, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. This is a New Testament concept that a believer, being at peace with God, would be able to approach God anytime. Isn't it wonderful 
that no matter whether we're praying for Oakley, whether we're praying for a trip that we're on, whether we're praying for a relationship or finances or whatever it is, that we know that we can have a direct access to God Himself through Jesus Christ. When you pray, you're not praying to some statue that can't do anything as an idol. You are praying to the God who created the heavens and the earth. Hold your very breath, your life, in His hands and is there to take care of you. Don't you love it to know that God wants to take care of you? Doesn't matter which situation is. Doesn't matter as I was talking to one this morning about a puppy that they're nursing back to health because he got his paws burned. Doesn't matter if it's a house that got gutted and everything back in Mississippi. Doesn't matter if it's a relationship that you're trying to rebuild and strengthen. Doesn't matter what it is. That God is there to help you come through it. Amen. I was talking to, well, I was talking to James earlier this morning. We were talking about miracles. And you know, God doesn't just, He doesn't just create miracles on a whim because we say we need a miracle. Anybody need a miracle this morning, by the way? <laughs> yes, we need miracles. But let me tell you about miracles. Miracles are in God's timing, okay, and are for God's purpose. They're not for our purpose. Miracles are for God's purpose. So we pray for miracles, don't we? And we expect God to respond in some way when we pray. Because we are children of God and we go to God our Father, Abba Father, we, we kind of climb up in His lap and He hugs us and we say, God... This is what I need. <clears throat> and God looks at us and says, if I give you that, you're going to be in big trouble. You don't need a motorcycle at 14 years old, okay? So God has a lot of wisdom. But you know, ultimately, God gives us what we actually need in this life. And so it doesn't matter what situation you find yourself in today, God's got your back. In fact, He is your forward shield and your rear guard. Amen. So the second blessing that we find of the New Covenant is found in verse 2 through 4, and it's a blessing of hope. And we, the Bible says, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. James 3 alludes to this in the suffering idea when he writes... In James chapter 1, verse 3, you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. It's a lot of those P words, persevere, perseverance, and producing, and all that kind of stuff. When God says that the testing of your faith produces something, then we should know that God allows tests to come into our life. Can I get an amen? amen. He allows us to be tested. You know, we think sometimes we're in Bible study or Sunday school or, or even our canopy Bible study, I hand out a little handout for them to fill out. And what I want to say is there's going to be a test. Because God says there's going to be a test. And so we should listen closely and we should apply God's Word to our lives because He's going to test us. And you don't want to fail the test. You want to pass. Amen? You want to get an A-plus on that test. So you don't have to do a makeup test. Makeup tests are no fun. Trust me. In school I had a lot of them. Because I had to have them. But here we see Paul. He's using the words of suffering, perseverance, and characters to climax hope. This idea of suffering lead, uh, leading to hope of the glory of God relates to both the beginning of Adam and the, it ends in the New Testament with the return of Christ. Suffering for the cause of Christ proved that Paul was the apostle who was called by God, just as it identifies true Christians today. You see, we're not outside the realm of suffering. God allows us sometimes to suffer. Well, how can a loving God do that? Because He's building you. He's building your character through perseverance and through suffering. Jesus said, I'm, they, I, they persecuted me. Didn't he say that? 
And they will perse and they persecuted the prophets in the Old Testament. Didn't he say that? And what else did he say? He said, and they'll persecute you for my name's sake. So as we proclaim Christ, we can expect persecution. And I dare say that we don't experience today in this country like many. But believing that we will not suffer in this life is to deny what the truth of the Scriptures tell us. Many believers around the world, right now as I'm speaking, they are physically persecuted. But you know, the church grows through persecution. And while we say, oh Lord, take this persecution away from me, is that really what we ought to be praying? I think we ought to be praying, Lord, whatever your will is for me at this time, let it come. Let it come. Because I know my God's going to take care of me. And you say, well, you know, there are some who are persecuted to the point of death. God took care of them. Life is just like Ecclesiastes says, it's like a vapor of smoke that rises up for a moment and then it's gone. That's what this life is. And so while we put a lot of stock in life and we, we certainly love life because God gives it to us, we need to recognize we're just here for a short time. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. And so what we do in the body is what counts for all eternity, doesn't it? What we do now, the ministry that we work at now, that we complete now, that we get involved in. I had one person tell me one time, well, well, I'm not a pastor, so I can't do anything, or I'm not a deacon. Excuse me, the Bible says that you are all ministers of the gospel. Ministers of the gospel. What does that mean? It means you're a messenger of the gospel, the good news, that you carry out to anybody and everybody who will listen. Some of them are going to tell you, shut up, I don't want to hear that. And you just <coughs> wipe your hands and move on to the next person. <clears throat> I remember when I got involved in the insurance business decades ago, and I went to insurance school and they told me how to present uh, the products that we had. And so I got out in front of people and I started doing that. And this person looked at me and said, no, I don't want none of that. I said, okay, I closed my book. I went to the next person. And they might have said, no, I don't want none of that. I closed my book. I went to the next person. But you know, my closing ratio ended up beating 7 out of 10. Ultimately, I closed. Why? Because I kept doing the same thing until I found the people that said yes. And sometimes we get hit in the face. People don't want to hear about Jesus. But if you keep going to the next one, listen, God has a good closing ratio. And He will touch the hearts of people that you share the gospel with. And He will touch their hearts. And, you know, you may fumble around trying to do the simple thing. Or you may have the Roman road memorized. And, <clears throat> and you may make your way through it. And they look at you and say, yes, I want to receive Jesus. And, and don't pick up the phone and call the pastor. You got it. Amen. You tell them how to receive Jesus. And God will bless you for it. He'll save a soul. We really do have a job to do here. Well, Paul gets this idea of suffering and he carries it on. And, and while many people around the world are suffering for Christ today, I don't believe we're really suffering for Jesus. There are times when we're a little, someone gets mad at us or throws something at us or something because we want to talk to them about Jesus. Just move on. Go to the next one. Because as I said, God has people waiting. He's already prepared their heart and He's looking for us to bring them the good news so they can say yes to Jesus. We don't become complacent by sitting around doing nothing. We've got a job to do. And God has called us all to be a part of it. All of this is to say that suffering for Jesus is proof that a person is a member of the new covenant and awaits, really we're awaiting the full revelation or realization of the glory of God that one day will come to all of us. I can't wait till we're doing what that song said and we're all gathered around the river that flows from the throne of God and we're talking and we're singing and we're worshiping together for all eternity. 
no more problems, no more issues, no more hurricanes, no more issues with relations and people, no more financial problems, no more getting in your car, turning the key and it going click, amen? Have you had that happen? So God has got a plan and he has included us because of our faith in Jesus and one day we will gather around that river. The third blessing is seen in verses 5 through 11. It's a blessing of love. Let me read it to you. Verse 5 says, And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who's been given to us. I love that the, the, the Scripture says that the Holy Spirit has been given to us. He, not it, He has been given to us. And we are recipients of God's Holy Spirit as a down payment and a guarantee that God is going to complete our salvation. Verse 6 says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 7 says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person some might possibly dare to die. But look at this verse. For God... But God demonstrates His love for us in this, that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. While you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. Since we now have been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. You see, Paul is telling us that it is through our faith in Christ, not by works, but by faith, that we've been reconciled back to God. We were apart from God. We were enemies of God. But through Christ Jesus and His sacrifice, we have been made children of God and reconciled back into that right relationship with Him. We could spend the rest of the day unpacking this Scripture, but I'm going to try to be brief. First of all, Paul's metaphor of reconciliation forms inclusion with justification. This unity is simply different sides of the same coin. Reconciliation balances those legal terms that we saw in the first four chapters of justification with uh, the other part that we're going to talk about by faith. And the Bible says we should never be ashamed of our hope in Christ because, the Scripture says, because God's love for us has been poured out into our hearts, through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. A key statement here is in verse 8. It says, But God demonstrates His love for us in this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, this is God's demonstration. It's what He's proclaiming to the world. He's showing us that while we were wretched sinners, Christ chose to die for wretched sinners. That those wretched sinners might have opportunity to hear the good news of the gospel and to accept Jesus as Messiah and the Son of God and His sacrifice on Calvary. Yes, none of us were good, but Christ died for us anyway. He died for you and He died for me. And verse 9 is another reinforcement of this truth. That, that God's children will not suffer His wrath. You know, I, I find it interesting that Scripture tells us through over and over that God's children are not subject to God's wrath, and yet some people look at the book of Revelation and say, well, we're going through some of that suffering, some of that wrath. I don't see that. The Scripture says that we shall be saved from God's wrath through Him. Amen. So if you want to hang around during the tribulation for the wrath, go ahead. But I'm checking out at the rapture time. 
And why is all this? It's because we've been justified by His blood that He shed on Calvary's cross. And if there was ever an expression of love by God, it's revealed in verse 10 and 11. Frankly, it's unimaginable to us to conceive that while we were enemies with God, that He would allow His own Son to come and die on Calvary for us. Remember verse 10 says, While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled through Him, the death of his, through the death of His Son. And now we've been loved by Him enough to be reconciled to Him. He saves us from the punishment of sin, listen, that we deserve. Amen? We deserve that punishment. But Jesus took it on the cross, and He died once for all, Hebrews says. And God, you know, is certainly amazing. His grace is amazing. I want to leave you with two important points this morning. First of all, justification and reconciliation are two aspects that complement one another. And furthermore, our peace with God bestows on us as believers a new legal standing before God as well as a restored relationship with Him. And secondly, Jesus said that we should rejoice when we suffer for His name's sake. Because it shows that we're taking up our cross and we're following Him daily. Amen? We become stronger through afflictions and we learn to trust Him more and we put our faith and our hope in Jesus. We're all blessed with peace, with hope, and with love all because of what Jesus Christ has done for us personally. Amen. Would you stand with us as we pray?